All right, well, good morning. It's great to see everybody this morning. Uh, it's just uh, what, a, what a gift to be able to worship together with, with some of us here today. So if you're here today, just give a shout out that you're here worshiping in person. <laughs> Yeah, it's great to see everybody. Um, for those of you who are guests with us this morning or are watching online, we're so glad that you've joined us as well. Um, I love our little chat box on the side there, so if you're able to or would like to introduce yourself to us, go ahead and do that. Um, I just always love it to, to see and, and write all the chats and see how people welcome people, especially if they're new to Lighthouse. But my name is Nancy. I'm one of the pastors here at Lighthouse Christian Church, and we're just so glad to be able to worship uh, with you this morning. And uh, again, we are here uh, live in, in a recording, kind of a hybrid service today, but we're going to meet in person on Saturdays for the this month as well as next month. And so there's a sign up for you to, uh, you know, on the sign up genius to let us know if you'd like to come and we're going to have a limited capacity, but we'd love for you to come, come with your small groups, with your friends and families and to worship in person. So you can sign up for that um, and, and the link in the chat there. Uh, well, just a couple of other announcements for us this morning. Today is the last day to register for our online, our virtual retreat that's coming up on May 1st and 2nd. Again, our guest speaker is going to be Pastor John Teeter from Fountain of Life Covenant Church in Southern California. He's just a great speaker. Many of us went to his evangelism seminar, but his talks are going to be on how Jesus wants to change the world, and we need change in our world, and, and it'll be a great time of encouragement. So please sign up for that. Um, the link will also be be um, online there. But this, today is the last day to register, so please go ahead and do that. Okay, well, next week, uh, if you are a guest with us or new to us or just like to meet other people or meet our staff, we are having a welcome luncheon that's also on Zoom online. It'll be right after service from 11.15 to noon, and there's also a link on that online as well. So please join us, and it's a great chance for you to meet the staff and meet other people at our church and, and for us to greet you. All right, uh, well today, uh, after our service on Sunday, from 11.15 to noon, we will have a prayer gathering, but also an opportunity to meet our uh, InterVarsity staff uh, members that we support as a church, our Lighthouse missionaries. So you met uh, Kim Porter last week, she shared a video, and we'll also hear from Stephen Ambo. And so we have a short video from Stephen to just share about who he is and his ministry on the college campuses. So take a look at this. My name is Stephen Ambo, and I've been a part of this church in some way or another for the past 20 years. Like Kim, I got involved with InterVarsity during my time in college. It deepened my faith immeasurably, and so after graduating nine years ago, I came on staff to help students in their own faith journeys. And you, Lighthouse, have been generously supporting me from day one. Thank you. I currently serve at Willamette University in Salem, Oregon, and in my role as a campus staff minister, I have three main goals. One, to love and serve college students. Two, to help students from Christian backgrounds and non-Christian backgrounds to explore who Jesus is for themselves. And three, to develop and empower the next generation of Christian leaders. We do this by training them and walking with them in all sorts of things, uh, leading Bible studies, pastoring their small group members, being open about their lives with Jesus, cultivating spiritual disciplines, and loving their neighbors, even when those neighbors are being really annoying. The pandemic has slowed that ministry, certainly, but I'm encouraged by two things. First, we are seeing that God is still at work. Planting new ministries during this pandemic was not something that was on my radar as I thought about the year, but recently I helped two of my students to start an athlete small group, and it has been a joy to see the way that students are flocking to this group and helping each other grow in their faith. Second, this slowing is doing good character work in both students and myself. Uh, it's testing our belief that our worth is not, in fact, in what we can produce or what we have to show for our efforts but solely in the love of Jesus. In this past year, we've gotten a painfully clear view of the challenges that this next generation faces. Political polarization, ongoing racial violence and injustice, ecological crisis, widespread loneliness, anxiety, and depression. This world needs more people who can courageously face those challenges while being grounded in the love of Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Our ministry aims to help students become that kind of person, and we could not do that without you. Thank you. 
Well, it's just so great to hear from Stephen. And he, uh, Stephen and his family were part of the original planting group uh, that started Lighthouse. So uh, he's been with us a long time. But I'm also a product of, of campus, college campus ministry. So uh, we really want to keep them in prayer. And so we're going to gather uh, next week to, to pray for them and pray for their ministry. So please join us. We'd love to have you. And there's a link there also on your chat room. All right, well, um, now we just want to ex- invite you to worship with your tithes and offerings. So some of uh, us have been giving online. Some of us have uh, been writing a check and sending it into the church office. But we really appreciate those of you who have been faithfully giving to our church and enabling us to continue our ministry and also to serve those in need around us and around the world as well. So go ahead and take a moment to do that. Well, here at Lighthouse, our mission, our hope and prayer is to share God's grace and truth so people come to know, love, and serve Jesus. And uh, as we think about that and we think about all that's going on in our world, um, let's just turn to God and, and look to him in prayer this morning. So would you just join me? Lord God, we come to you today, first of all, just with with thankful hearts. We're thankful for who you are, that you are a God of peace, hope, and love. You're a God of justice and mercy. You are the creator of heaven and earth, and yet you are gentle toward us and attentive to our needs. And you are at work to bring about healing and transformation transformation in us and through us. And we're thankful just how each new day is a day filled with possibilities for us to show love to those around us, and in doing so, point people to you. And Lord, um, we come to you today also with heavy hearts. We, we grieve the loss of loved ones, those we cannot mourn with or celebrate with in, or even see in person due to this pandemic. And then we still struggle with this endless news of violence, fear, and hatred toward people of color in the use of deadly force, the mass shootings in Atlanta and now in Boulder, Colorado. We are just burdened by the fact that in this past, last year, gun violence killed 45,000 people, 45,000 people more than any other year in the past two decades. And, and this just grieves us, Lord, and we acknowledge just the anger, the blame, the anxiety, and even the hopelessness that many feel on a daily basis. But God, we also come to you this morning with faith and hope with assurance that none of this is beyond your purview, that even as we pray, you are here, you are listening, you are still at work in our midst. And so we ask for courage and strength that we might be your hands, feet, and face in this world, that that even though, Lord, we confess our fears, our desire to protect ourselves rather than risk our safety to protect others, we confess sometimes we are disengaged, especially from the burdens and sufferings of those who are different from ourselves. But God, we ask for your heart, your strength to speak out against injustice and to lift up those who feel powerless or alone or marginalized. God, give us courage and the strength that we need to be the first to reach out, the first to give sacrificially, the first to extend generosity and forgiveness. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayers this morning. It is, in, it is in you, God, where we find our comfort, our strength, and our hope. So in this all, in this beautiful and powerful name of Jesus, God, we pray to you this morning, and we thank you for hearing our prayers. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. We welcome you to Lighthouse. We want you to have a time of, of singing and, and worshiping God as we Join together in fellowship and just Sabbath together and worship together our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, yeah, so we ask you as you sing, uh, if you're able, please rise. And we're going to just sing about, uh, as a result of his great resurrection, we want to just sing about Christ and his goodness and his glory and his love, his power and his grace. So let's, let's sing together. Christ alone, in Christ alone, my hope is 
is found. He is my Lord, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. Death of Christ I live. There in the ground, there in the ground, his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day.
great to have uh, real people, a live audience here, and I know uh, I'm glad to see all you folks, and I can see you're smiling underneath your masks. <laughs> <laughs> How can I know that? And uh, for all of you that are joining us online, welcome. So glad you could uh, be with us for this worship service. I want to talk today, as we're going through the Gospel of John, I want to talk about John, part of John chapter 12, and the message is called The Time for Glory, The Time for Glory. You know, our times are in God's hands. And we know that, maybe intellectually, but I think it's really been driven home to us in the past uh, 13, 14 months or so. Our times are in God's hands, and ultimately we're not really in control of our lives. I think COVID has reminded us of that, that life is fragile, life is fleeting. Uh, I know in the early months uh, of this pandemic and after things started to shut down last spring, I would hear these stories about people who were absolutely, totally, perfectly healthy, and then they caught the COVID virus, and then within a week they were dead. And I would hear those stories on the news and you know, just through uh, uh, word of mouth, and okay, it was just so shocking, and it was scary, right? It was a very scary time, and of course we're still uh, living uh, with the pandemic to some extent, but I think in many ways we've learned how to cope better and how to wear masks and social distance and, and to be careful, and fortunately, the vaccines are, are rolling out and more and more people are getting vaccinated. Uh, but we've been reminded that our times can change quickly, right? that we can go from uh, a, a period of comfort and stability and, and maybe affluence and prosperity, and then all of a sudden we can find ourselves in the midst of pandemic and upheaval. It reminded me of something from uh, Tolkien's uh, book, The Fellowship of the Ring. And as, as you may know, that it, it talks about a, a crisis time and, and um, there's a calling on Frodo, and Frodo has to answer the call to rise above his circumstances, do something courageous unlike anything he's ever done before, and to fulfill a, a great mission that's going to help save the world. And at one point, uh, Frodo says this to Gandalf, the wizard. Frodo says, I wish it need not have happened in my time. 
And I was thinking, boy, that's a great you know, just slogan for you know, this time that we're in. I wish it need not have happened in my time, said Frodo. So do I, said Gandalf, and so do all who live to see such times. But, the wizard goes on to say, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. And while we've been reminded of the, the fragility of, of life and the, uh, the briefness of it at times, that uh, we're not in control and that what we thought might be certain is not so certain anymore. While we're reminded of all that, we're also reminded that ultimately God is in charge of our lives and in our, our times. And, you know, Jesus lived his life on earth in, um, with that sense of God's timing. He wanted to live according to God's timetable for him, and he was very aware of that. There's a sense of, as we read the Gospel of John and then the story of Jesus and his ministry, there's this sense of uh, destiny about it. There's this sense of, of things unfolding uh, according to some uh, divine timeline. And uh, Jesus speaks repeatedly about his time or his hour. Here are some of the things he says. Back in chapter 2, verse 4, when he was about to perform his first public miracle in the Gospel of John, which was the wedding at Cana and how he turned the water into wine, uh, Jesus replied to his mother, My hour has not yet come. Uh, what does that mean? My hour has not yet come. That's chapter 2, verse 4. And then in chapter 7, verse 30, by the time we get to chapter 7, uh, he's got enemies. There are people that are plotting uh, his downfall. And in chapter 7, verse 30, it says, At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. This sense of divine destiny in, in a sense that he's, uh, he's you know, uh, invincible until his hour comes. No one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And then in chapter 8, verse 20, we read this. He spoke these words, this is Jesus. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. And we see this throughout the Gospel of John. There's this escalating tension between Jesus and the Jewish leaders. There's a growing animosity that they have toward him. They feel threatened by him. Sometimes they feel competitive toward him. Uh, they feel afraid that if Jesus becomes too popular and too many people believe in him, that the growing uh, Jesus movement might cause the, the Roman oppressors to, to feel threatened. And they might come down on, on the Jews and destroy their temple or... Uh, uh, curtail their freedoms, and that the Jewish leaders, these members of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, and the Pharisees, and some of the Sadducees, they're afraid that if Jesus becomes too popular and too many people follow him, that it will threaten their position in society, that Rome will take away some of their freedom and autonomy. And so they want to start plotting to kill Jesus. But as much as they think about how can we arrest him, how can we seize him, how can we kill him, they really can't touch him until his hour comes. So that's what we see here. No one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Now, when we come today to chapter 12, we finally see this, that Jesus does say in verse 23, the hour has come. And he describes it this way, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And we're going to see from the context here that when he talks about the hour has come, he's really talking about his impending betrayal and suffering and his death. And the irony for us, or maybe the surprise for us, is he says, he speaks of that hour, that time, this period of, of his, quote, his earthly downfall as a, as a human being, and he says, that's actually going to be the hour for glory. Okay? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and he's speaking of his impending death on the cross. Now, it's very clear uh, what this hour is in the following chapters. Let me mention a couple of them. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. So that's what the hour means. He says, you know, my hour has not yet come. Now he says, my hour has come. It's the hour for glory. It's the hour for suffering. It's the hour for Jesus to get ready to return to the Father and enjoy the glory that he had before he came to earth. In chapter 17, verse uh, 1, it says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. And here's what he prayed, chapter 17, verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. Here's what I want to talk about today. Our, our lives, our times are in God's hands. And that was true for Jesus. And Jesus says, the time, the hour, when the hour comes for him, 
It's the hour of suffering, but it's also the hour of glory. So at this pivotal center of, of John's gospel, uh, he, John gives us Jesus' most significant statement about glory. And basically, glory, uh, glory has many meanings in the Bible, but think of it uh, this way. Glory has to do with the brightness of God's presence. When God shows up, when God reveals himself and people see the glory of God, it has to do with seeing God for who he is, seeing God as he is, or at least getting to glimpse that. It, it's often a, a, a scene of majesty and wonder and power. Sometimes in the Old Testament, you know, there was smoke or clouds or fire. But the idea of the glory of God has to do with the manifestation of his presence. When God reveals himself, that's glory, the brightness of God's presence, right here on our own home ground. And Jesus is saying, that his death and burial has something to do with God's glory. So Jesus takes the brightest word in our vocabulary, glory, and then he plunges it into the darkest pit of our experience, a violent, excruciating death. Everything we ever associated with glory needs to now be recast. Let me read some of this, John chapter 12. Uh, let me read verses 20 to 26. We'll get a feel for this. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. This would be uh, the festival during Passover week in Jerusalem, uh, the last week of Jesus' life. And they came to Philip, who was one of his 12 disciples. And Philip uh, is actually a, a Greek name. And Philip came from this area called Bethsaida, which is a, 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 an area that has a lot of uh, Greeks uh, speaking people there. So it's very likely that Philip understood Greek. So these Greeks who come to worship at the festival, they are what's called, they're Gentiles, but they're God-fearers. They're sympathetic to the Jewish religion. They are attracted and drawn to the, the ethics and the morality and maybe the monotheism of the Jewish religion. And so there were, there were Gentiles who didn't fully convert to Judaism. They didn't get uh, circumcised and all of that, but they're, they're what's called God-fearers. They're people that are sympathetic to the Jewish religion. And they apparently are here in Jerusalem for the Passover festival week as well. And these Greeks, uh, they want to see Jesus. So they go to Philip, who probably has some affinity with the Greek culture and the Greek language, and they say to him, we would like to see Jesus. So Philip goes to what apparently is his best friend among the 12, his friend Andrew, and uh, he tells Andrew, and then together Andrew and Philip come to tell Jesus, these Greeks want to speak to you, these Gentiles. And here's Jesus' re reply, verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, and very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now, Jesus, he says, you know, my hour has come. And it's going to be the time, not only of suffering and death, but the time of glory. And then he gives this illustration. And how many of you are gardeners? Some of you garden. Okay, I, I'm not much of a gardener at all. I can barely keep my lawn cut. But, but we know this, that he's speaking uh, in, with the kind of imagery that, that we, we all understand. It goes something like this, that each spring, uh, gardeners and farmers, they, they bury seeds in their garden or they plant seeds in their field. And then it, sometime later in a few weeks or some crops months, uh, they enjoy the beauty, the beauty of the crop, right? The beauty of flowers blooming and or maybe the nourishment of vegetables and all of that. So it's a familiar experience. Uh, you plant the seed in the ground in a sense it bar it's buried, it dies, but then it springs forth, right? To new life. It has to die in order for the new life to come. And then that single seed which dies can actually multiply many fold and actually result in great fruitfulness. So, so this is what Jesus is doing. He's using this familiar experience, planting a seed in the soil and then the ensuing fruitfulness. And he's using it to speak of the mystery of how his death will actually be the time for glory. So he's saying his death which looks like just a terrible tragedy and miscarriage of justice and the most horrible thing that could happen. You know, the one truly innocent man who ever lived, the, the only person who ever lived without sin, and yet he's, uh, you know, s subjected to the ex excruciating suffering and torture and, and this humiliating death on the cross, the death of a, of a criminal. All of that's going to happen, and yet Jesus says, actually, there's going to be glory in it because of what it's going to accomplish. And then Jesus gives this discipleship implication 
for all of us, all, any of us who, who are followers of Jesus or, or who are thinking about following Jesus. He gives this discipleship implication in verses uh, 24 to 26. So let me read that part again. He says, Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Again, that's a picture of Jesus' death and how he's going to be resurrected from the dead and it's going to lead to salvation and new life for all, all who would respond to him, all who would believe in him. But then here's the discipleship implication. He says, Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Well, anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So here's the, here's the implication that Jesus is saying. He's saying, in a sense, we have to also, like that seed buried in the ground, we have to die. Uh, not necessarily physically, although it could mean that, but we have to die to ourselves. We have to die to our pride, to our self-sufficiency, to our need to, to be in control of our own lives, to call our own child. He says, if you die to yourself, then you can be reborn. You can receive God's life. Some of us, you know, it's like God wants to give us life. God wants to bless us. God wants to fill us. But our, our hands are so full of our own stuff and we're clutching and we're clinging you know, to control and, and maybe pride. And, and, and so whatever God wants to do in our lives, however God wants to bless us in whatever ways he wants to fill us, uh, it doesn't happen because, you know, I imagine it's kind of like God pouring blessing on your life, but, but nothing, nothing sticks because my hands are too filled with my own stuff, my own agenda, maybe my own arrogance, my own pride. So Jesus says, in a sense, you've got to hate your life in this world in order to receive eternal life. Now, now, you know, obviously he, he's speaking metaphorically, but he's speaking about in comparison uh, with our love for this world, our love for the life with God has to be so much greater. I've got to decide at some point, uh, do I want the life that I carve out for myself through my own control and autonomy, or do I want the life that God designed me for and created me for, uh, the life that he wants to give me, the ways that he wants to bless me? So I think that's what he's talking about. He's talking about our need to die to ourself, our pride, and to give our lives to him. Sometimes people say, well, have you accepted Jesus? Or have you asked Jesus to come into your heart? Now, that's a good question, but let me tell you a better question. I think it's actually a more biblical question. The question is this, have you given your life to Jesus? That's really what it means to receive him or to believe in him. Have you given your life to Jesus? When you give your life to Jesus, then you're his. You belong to him. And then you're in a position to receive everything he wants to give you. You're, a you're in a position to experience everything that he wants to do in you. Jesus put it this way in one of the other gospels, the gospel of Luke chapter nine, uh, verses 23 to 25. Uh, Jesus says this, Luke 9, 23 to 25. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple. Now, I want you to notice the word whoever is a kind of a very inviting word. It's, it's open to everybody, whatever your religious background or your cultural background or your economic status or, you know, your racial identity. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple. The, the, you know, the gates are thrown wide open. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me deny myself, take up my cross daily means, you know, that I, I'm going to identify with his death. I'm, I'm willing to, to die to myself, to take up my cross. So he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, you know, the door is wide open and you're welcome to come. Uh, but in order to come, you've got to leave something behind, right? In order to come, he says, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. And then in Luke 9, 24, he says, for whoever wants to save their life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. That's what he means when he says you have to hate your life in order to receive eternal life. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. And in case we didn't really get the point, here's what Jesus says in the next verse, Luke 9, 25. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their soul? their very self. Uh, I remember the, the old translations used to say, what shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? 
So it, that's what Jesus is saying. God wants to bless us. He wants to do good things in our lives. But in a sense, I guess we could say, we've got to get out of the way, right? We've got to get out of the way. So what Jesus calls for us to do is very counterculture. You know, in a culture that, that tells us to acquire more as much as you can and to grasp tight, tightly to whatever we value and to seek to advance ourselves and always stay safe no matter what, uh, Jesus is calling us to believe, to trust, to submit, to follow. Some of us, we started out, we embarked on this journey of following Jesus, but we didn't follow very far. <laughs> and maybe it's because we, uh, we hadn't really counted the cost. Or maybe we thought we could just add Jesus as you know, a little religion. I remember when I came to faith, my mom, uh, my parents used to force me to go to church you know, when I was growing up. And I didn't want to go necessarily, but you know, there was a lot of pressure to go to church. Now, the surprising thing to you might be that my parents didn't go to church. But it was very important to them that their kids went to church, or at least to Sunday school. And so uh, we went dutifully. And um, when I, I think when I got to be about 15, I was probably on the verge of dropping out. And I think at that age, my parents probably would have let me drop out. And uh, most of my friends at, at school were not believers and Christians and all of that. And um, something happened to me right around that age when I was about 15, right after I turned 15, actually. And uh, Jesus encountered me. I went to a, a place, a Christian conference, first Christian conference I'd ever gone to. In fact, I think I was the first person in my family that had ever gone to a, a church retreat or conference. And uh, in the middle of that week, uh, I met Jesus. And I had heard about Jesus pretty much all my life. I had sort of believed, yeah, Jesus is probably the Son of God, but doesn't really mean anything to me. I sort of believed the Bible is probably the Word of God, but I wasn't reading it or paying much attention to it at all. So I kind of believed some of these things, but I also knew in my heart I really wasn't committed. I, I did not call myself a Christian, and I'm glad my church made it clear that I really wasn't a Christian, uh, although I believed in God. That doesn't make you a Christian. But what happened that week was uh, I began to realize that I was sitting on the fence. I sort of believed in God, but it wasn't impacting my life, and I wasn't allowing him to really do anything with me because I was totally in control. And uh, I got to the point on a Wednesday night during the conference where I realized I can't just sit on the fence. Right? You've got to jump one way or the other. I, I could jump to, to unbelief, and at least I would be consistent because I was already living in unbelief. Although intellectually I thought, you know, I think Jesus is God or whatever. But I, I needed to jump one way or the other. And um, I think the Lord really just kind of revealed himself to me, you know. And uh, I, I began to realize, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust Jesus. Or at least I'm going to try trusting Jesus. I remember my conversion prayer was something like this. Uh, Lord, I've been in control all my life. And now I'm going to give you a chance. <laughs> not a real spiritual prayer. <laughs> not very theologically sophisticated. But, but basically, that was the decision I, I needed to make, uh, that I had to decide whether I'm going to trust in God or not, whether I'm going to let my belief that God exists impact the way I live and the orientation of my life. Now, I want to tell you, you know, all these years later, that was the most important decision I've ever made. And that was the best decision I ever made. In fact, that began to change the whole course of my life. I was only 15, so I didn't know much about my life or myself or my future. But I did begin to understand in the following months that I want to live my life with Jesus. That if he loves me and created me and created me in the image of God and he has a plan and a purpose for me, then I don't want to miss out on that. I want to pursue that. I want to walk with him and get to know him better. And I, I've been uh, trying to do that ever since. Now, if Jesus says, you've got to deny yourself and take up your cross, then that's going to be the time of glory for you. Think of glory, uh, I said it's kind of like the manifest presence of God and, and the, the revelation of God. But also, for us, glory can also mean honor. Like when Jesus says, uh, Father, glorify me or glorify yourself. It means, may you be honored, right? So I want you to think about this. In a sense, when you follow Jesus, that becomes for you the hour of glory. It may entail some suffering or setbacks or sacrifice as well, but it becomes for you the hour of glory, the hour of honor. 
Uh, here's what Jesus says in verses 25 and 26. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will be also, and my Father will honor the one who serves me. So this is, I sense, our time for glory, and it's our time for honor, our time to walk more deeply and more fully into the life that Jesus came to give, and that Jesus died in order that we can receive it. So think about this. One thing Jesus says is, you'll receive eternal life. Eternal life is not just life after you die. Eternal life has to do with the fullness of the God life. The fullness of the God life, of life in God. That's eternal life. It can begin when you give your life to Jesus, but then it continues on throughout the rest of your life on this earth, and then after you die for all eternity. Eternal life isn't just after you die and when you go to heaven. Eternal life is the life that he wants to give you now, that he wants us to experience now. It's the life of the kingdom. It's the life of the age to come, which has broken into this age and now is available for us to begin to experience. So this is what he says is, you come and you follow me, you're going to receive eternal life. He also says you're going to be blessed by his presence. See, glory is the, the brightness of Jesus' presence with us. And Jesus says here, wherever he is, there my servant will be also. So think about the implication of that. He's basically promising his presence, right? That where he is, we would be. And where we are, if we're following his will and aligning ourselves with his will, then that's where he is. So it's the promise of the presence of God, the glory of the brightness of Jesus' presence ever with us. Wherever he is, we're right there with him. And Jesus often, he would make these promises like he would say, uh, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you, right? Uh, he would say things like, uh, and, and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And so it's the blessing of his presence. This is so important. Sometimes people think of Christianity or the Christian faith as just a religion. It's about, you know, uh, believing the right things and about doing the right things. You know, you're supposed to go to church and read your Bible and pray and, and give to the church and all of that. that. That's all part of it, but it's not the essence of it. The essence of it is this relationship. The essence of it is life with God through his son, Jesus. And Jesus says, wherever my servant is, that's where I'm going to be. And, and wherever I am, that's where my servants are going to be. And we're going to do this life together. So, yeah, we still live on this fragile uh, earth and we still have these fleeting lives but our days on earth can be actually filled with meaning a lot of you know that I have a granddaughter now I actually have a grandson on the way too I'm praying for uh, safe uh, delivery of, of that child this summer but um, be, I don't know some of you are grandparents it changes you right it changes you and it makes me think about uh, just wanting to enjoy every life and I've seen how fast my own children grew up, so I, I know my grandchildren are going to grow up really fast. I, I want to, you know, treasure the time and, and spend it well and invest in their lives and all of that. But I have to tell you this, sometimes when I'm watching my granddaughter, and it's one of my, my favorite pastimes these days, I think about, gee, will I still be here to see her graduate from high school? She's three years old now, so she's about 15 years away, right? Will I still be here to maybe see her graduate from college? if she goes to college or will I be here to attend her wedding you know and I don't know because these things are like 20 years away or something and and who knows but it re just reminds me that yeah life is fragile life is fleeting we have no guarantees of how long we're going to live or how well we're going to be but this we can do uh, like Gandalf told Frodo you know live it well our responsibility is not to determine our times and and the length of them but we do have decisions about how we're going to live them, and live it for Jesus, live it for the Lord. So Jesus says this, uh, you're going to be, receive eternal life, you're going to be blessed by his presence, and then he makes this promise, this is at the end of verse 26, he says, my father will honor the one who serves me. So he's been talking about his glory, father glorify your son, father glorify yourself, but here he says, my father will honor, it's, it's a, kind of the, that, that word glorify, my father will honor the one who serves me. And so this is what I think he's saying, is when you follow Jesus, whatever costs you might have to pay, whatever sacrifices you have to make, when you follow Jesus, you never lose out. 
we don't have to worry about what we're going to be deprived of. In fact, uh, at some points the Bible says, you know, you, what you're going to get is you're going to get the life that is life indeed. Not just existing, not just surviving, not just going through the motions. You receive the life that is life indeed, what Jesus called the abundant life. He says, I've come to give life and to give it abundantly. And so I think this is what Jesus is doing. He says, I'm going to die to give you that life. But in order to enter into that life, you're going to have to die to yourself and give your life to me. Uh, let me go on. Uh, chapter 12, John 12, verses 27 to 29. Okay, here's what it says. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. Now this is the third time in Jesus' ministry that he has received a voice from heaven, the voice of the Father uh, speaking uh, you know, from the heavens uh, to him. Right? The first time was at his baptism, right? and the second time was at uh, his uh, transfiguration. Right? This is my son, my beloved son, I'm pleased with him, or listen to him. And then this is the third time now where the voice from heaven comes and and uh, the voice came from heaven. I have glorified it. I have glorified your name, Jesus, and will glorify it again. And verse 29 says, the crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Apparently, the crowd there hears the voice, but maybe it's kind of muffled for them. They can't really understand exactly what the voice said. Some people think it was just like thunder. And sometimes in the Old Testament, when God spoke, it was described like thunder very impactful, maybe very loud. Um, and so they didn't necessarily understand the words, but they, they knew that something had happened. Some people said, well, it's just thunder. And other people said that an angel had spoken to him. So Jesus, he's foreseeing his soon coming betrayal. And he says, what should I do? Should I, should I pray, oh, God, Father, save me from this hour? He says, no, actually, this is the reason I've come. I've come to make this sacrifice. I've come to make this offering, the offering up of my life for the sins of the world. And so he's not going to be deterred. And he doesn't ask the Father to shield him from suffering. He doesn't ask the Father to spare him from execution. He submits himself to the Father's will. And he's going to fulfill his mission. And he's going to die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we ought to be thankful that he was willing to submit to his hour, his hour of suffering, which is his hour of glory. Now, I'm going to read a few more verses as we wrap up here. John chapter 12, verses 30 to 33. Here's the meaning of the cross. Jesus said, this voice is for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up, when I am lifted up from from the earth will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. And this is what the meaning of the cross is. Jesus really describes it in, ter in three terms here. Uh, he says, now is the time for judgment on this world. And that's one of the things, his cross is going to be, uh, kind of convict the world of its sin. Because he needs to die because that's how terrible our sin was. That's how hopeless was our spiritual situation. We were spiritually dead and we needed to be made alive. And Jesus, the Son of God, had to die to give us that life. So he says, the cross, in a sense, is going to pronounce judgment on the world. Of course, in the Gospel of John, we've seen that Jesus had a lot of detractors, often they're Jewish leaders, and some of them are named like Caiaphas, the high priest, and, and uh, some of them are, are named by classes, the Sanhedrin or the Pharisees. He had a lot of detractors, and he had opponents and people that were out to kill him. And, and his, when he dies on the cross and then is resurrected from the dead on the third day, that's going to be the judgment on the world. It's going to say, basically, you were wrong about Jesus, you Jewish leaders. You were wrong about Jesus, and it's going to be the conviction of the world's sin, that apart from him, we are lost in our sin. Apart from him, we are spiritually dead. So the meaning of the cross, he says, now is the time for judgment on this world. He also says, secondly, now the prince of this world will be driven out. And so the cross, the meaning of the cross is also about the defeat of Satan. Now Satan, there is an evil one, and he has a certain limited power. Sometimes he's called the ruler of this age, 
or the prince of this world. And, and he has a certain limited power, but, and Satan's main power is death. He, comes, he can steal and kill and destroy. He seeks to undermine people, not only physical death, but sometimes spiritual death. He will do everything he can to keep people from giving their lives to God. He will distract us. He will tempt us. He will lure us away. He will discourage us, right? And so Satan's power is the power of death, evil. And basically what Jesus is saying is now in his cross, the victory is over death. So Satan is robbed of his main weapon. It's the chief weapon. Uh, Satan uses tools like guilt and shame to discourage people or to cause them to make bad choices. And, and Jesus' cross is the victory over death. It's the victory over guilt and shame so that in him and through faith in him, we can live in forgiveness and we can live in goodness. So the meaning of the cross, judgment on this world, the defeat of Satan. Now, Satan still has a limited power during this age but there will come a time, the book of Revelation tells us, where Satan and, and all of his demons are going to be thrown into the lake of fire and, and uh, experience eternal judgment. And so we live today in, in light of that day, and Satan's defeat has already been assured. We're still kind of in some mop-up operations where he has some influence. But we don't have to live under the power of Satan. We can live under the power of God. And then the cross also means the exaltation of Jesus. And... Um, in verse 32, Jesus says, And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Now, lifting up here, it has really a double meaning. Part of the meaning is when he's lifted up on the cross. You know, when they put him on the cross, they nail him to the cross, and then they lift up the cross. So he is physically lifted up from the earth uh, in order to be crucified. So that's part of it. And lifted up here does, it is a reference to his crucifixion. But also lifted up can have a positive meaning, like when he's exalted, right? When he's placed in the position of honor. And so it's the exaltation of Jesus as well. Now, where does that leave us? That leaves us with decision time. Our passage ends this way, and I, I am going to read a few more verses. I forgot about that. I'm going to read a few more verses, verses 34 to 36. The crowd spoke up, we have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? In other words, how can you say that the, the Messiah will die? And of course, they don't know that the Messiah will die, but then be raised from the dead. Jesus doesn't directly answer their question, but instead he talks about light. Verse 35, then Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. And several times in the Gospel of John, he's already said, I am the light of the world, right? He says, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. In other words, if you don't come to the light of Jesus, you're just stumbling through the dark. You're just stumbling through life. You know, without meaning, without purpose, without ultimate vindication, right? You have no way to obtain the forgiveness of your sins. So he says, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they're going. Rather, verse 36, believe in the light while you have the light so that you may become children of light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and hid himself from them. But I want us to see this. He says, believe in the light while you have the light. Now that indicates that there's an opportune moment, right? There's a ripe time. Believe in the light while you have the light. And then he says, so that you would be transformed, that you would become children of light. So that's really uh, the decision that we face. Uh, I'm going to read you something that, that I wrote, some notes I took. It says, to refuse to believe in Jesus leaves us in the dark. And we don't know and we won't know where we're going. We'll be shut out from the light forever. We'll be stumbling through life without God's guidance or help or protection, without God's wisdom, without the meaning in life that only God can give. Uh, we have that choice, but it would be a terrible choice to turn away from the light. So he says, while you have the light, come to the light, turn to the light walk in the light, and then he has this beautiful phrase, he says, and you will become children of light. The people of God are the people who are to live in the light of God, of his grace, of his truth, of his goodness every day. All right, let's pray together. Well, thank you, Lord, that you are the light and that the light has come. And we've been seeing that all the way through our study of the Gospel of John, that the light has come into the world and the darkness has never overcome it. 
And Lord, as you are the light, we want to just live in the light. We thank you that you have come, that you've been willing to go to that cross to die for us. And Lord, that in you, we can actually find the reason why we were created. We can actually be reconciled with our creator God. We can actually have our sins forgiven and our guilt cleansed. And we can live in the glorious freedom of the children of God. So thank you, Lord. We praise you. We, are, we know that you are mighty. You are powerful and you are mighty to save. And we worship you, Lord. Amen. Falling on my knees in worship. Falling on my knees in worship. Giving all I am to seek your face. Lord, all I am is yours. My whole life, my whole life I place in your hands. God In my life be lifted high In my life be lifted high In our world be lifted high In our love be lifted In my life, be lifted. 
Everyone needs compassion. And everyone needs compassion. Love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness. The kindness of a Savior. The hope of nation. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. Heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquer the grave. So take me as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believed in. Now I surrender. I surrender. The Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty. He is mighty to save forever, author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave, Jesus conquer the grave, shine your light, shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory. Shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. And conquer the grave, Jesus conquer the grave, Savior, Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, heroes and conquer the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He rose, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus come one more time. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have won that victory over the grave and death and sin and darkness, and that you invite us into the glorious freedom of the children of God, and that you call us, Lord, to come to you as the light, and that in you, through faith in you, Lord Jesus, we can live in the light. We can become children of light. Lord, you are making all the difference in our lives. May we come to you and walk closely with you and enter into the fullness of the life that you want to give us. Thank you so much, Lord. And as you are the light of the world, you also tell us that we become the light of the world. We reflect your light to a world that so often struggles with violence and ignorance and darkness. And so we pray, Lord, that you will use us to shine your light, to point people to you, to extend your compassion, your justice, your encouragement and hope and the message of the good news of salvation in Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Thanks. You can go ahead and have a seat.
Okay, I want to say a word about what we're doing. We are inviting people to come in person. We can, we can have up to about 35 people, and you can come in person and worship with us. So we're going to do that uh, next Sunday as well, and then most of the Sundays in May. Uh, we're, we're doing it right now on Saturdays, and we record, and then everybody else can watch it online. Uh, two weeks, though, from today, we're going to have our, our church retreat. Uh, two week, you know, the first weekend, May 1st and 2nd. And so that weekend, uh, we're going to have a virtual retreat. If you haven't signed up yet, please sign up today. We're trying to make the deadline today. So you can go on our website, sign up for the retreat today. We really want to have you with us. And that retreat will go Saturday and Sunday. But for those of you that are not part of the retreat, uh, still come on on that Sunday. I think it's May 2nd at 10 a.m. And, and you'll join us for our worship service. For those of us at the retreat, that'll be our, our closing session of the retreat. Uh, but everybody can just join us online as you normally do, 10 o'clock on Sundays through our website, okay? Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're gonna have a prayer gathering for campus ministries uh, right after service here. It started at 11.15 to 12 o'clock. Uh, separately from that, we're gonna just have prayer rooms for people that wanna receive prayer. And so you can go on the prayer rooms and you can find that on our website as well. Okay, that's it. God bless you, have a wonderful week. <laughs>